Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Wednesday, everybody. Just a note to begin with: there may not be an episode tomorrow on Thursday. In the last two videos, we looked at some promising economic indicators, suggesting that there may be some stabilization in the Chinese economy. However, these evidently were not enough to impress markets. Yesterday, Tuesday, Chinese stocks listed in Hong Kong slumped as trading resumed after the holiday. The Hang Seng China Enterprises Index slid 3.2 percent, the biggest daily dip in almost three months. The same pessimism, which has weighed on Chinese equities for much of this year, still appears very much in place. Regular viewers know that after a short-lived promising start, Chinese stocks have performed very poorly in 2023. According to a new report from Morgan Stanley, global funds continued to reduce their holdings of Chinese stocks in September, bringing their average position on the market to the lowest level since 2020. We should note, however, that as the mainland is still on holiday, Chinese investors are not involved in trading, which should skew toward a negative bias, as international investors' sentiment is more negative than domestic feelings. How markets react in the coming weeks will be tied to two critical data points. Analysts, investors, and policymakers will all be watching closely from this week's Golden Week holiday. First will be tourism spending, a good proxy for consumer confidence. The second will be home sales. Golden Week is typically a peak season for new home sales, so it should provide an idea of whether Beijing's slew of support measures are having any effect or not. On the former, that is tourism numbers, things are looking rather positive. On the latter, however, housing, it's far less clear. Meanwhile, investors are not the only ones with a concerned outlook. In a new report published this week, the World Bank projects that China's economy is likely to slow next year due to continued domestic headwinds. Once again, cutting its growth projection for China in 2024 from 4.8 percent to 4.4 percent. In the bank's semi-annual outlook for East Asia and the Pacific region, it explains that factors such as the fading rebound from the reopening of the economy, China's huge debt, and the weakness of its property sector will all weigh on growth in China. Of course, none of these are any surprises, and others agree. Quote, Despite signs of stabilization, we remain cautious on growth. Recent signs of stabilization may also slow Beijing's efforts in rolling out the measures necessary to truly stabilize the economy, especially for the property sector. End quote. The question of GDP growth targets is once again a topic of debate too. Quote, a common discussion I've had with a few Chinese economists in recent weeks is about the GDP growth target Beijing will set during the December work conference, implicitly, if not explicitly. Most seem to agree that the lower the target, the better for China's medium and long-term prospects, and the more seriously it will suggest that Beijing is addressing its debt problems. However, nearly everyone seems to think that it will be extremely hard to set a target below four percent. Even four percent, they say, will be politically tough, and for now, the consensus seems to be that it will choose a 4.5 percent target. End quote. In previous statements, Professor Pettis has put the real underlying growth rate at somewhere between two to three percent. Let's continue moving through the episode. If you're enjoying the episode, don't forget to hit that like button, liking, sharing, and subscribing are big helps. And for anyone who can go the extra mile, Patreon and Buy Me a Coffee links are in the description below. This is the best way to help me keep China Update financially sustainable. Thank you so much, everybody. For the ongoing support yesterday, Tuesday, the EU published more details in relation to what technologies will be restricted as part of its so-called de-risking campaign with China. According to the Tuesday report, advanced semiconductors, artificial intelligence, quantum technologies, and biotech will be the initial focus of an economic security strategy because they present the quote most serious and immediate risks to the EU. End quote. With the publication of the report, the EU internal Market Commissioner told media, quote, "Europe is adapting to the new geopolitical realities, putting an end to the era of naivete, and acting as a real geopolitical power." End quote. Adding, quote, "This is not against anyone. This is not against any continent, country, or whatever. It is for us in Europe. We are working for the general interest of our fellow citizens." End quote. 
but of course it's clear that the new strategy has been formulated very much with China in mind. Indeed, we remember that the EU trade czar was recently in Shanghai where he warned that more de-risking would need to be pursued for the sake of national security. And in her speech back in March, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen warned of the threat posed to the bloc by Beijing. Quote, this list is a key signal of the bloc's willingness and ability to pursue efforts to de-risk from China. It provides concrete insights into the EU's thinking about what the risk of doing business with China really is, a key question for the EU to answer before initiating any risk mitigation efforts. The narrow list demonstrates that it is willing to de-risk, not decouple, from China. End quote. Beijing has repeatedly expressed that it views de-risking as a euphemism for decoupling. Hong Kong-based South China Morning Post writes too that efforts to compile the list have been beset by internal haggling between the Commission's pro-trade and protectionist factions. We have already seen this tug of war in the EU's response to Chinese EV production and exports to the EU. France had pushed for an anti-subsidies probe, while Germany opposed it. Six more technologies are in line for investigation next spring, namely advanced connectivity, navigation and digital technology, advanced sensing technology, space and propulsion technology, energy technology, robotics and advanced materials. Also yesterday, Tuesday, the European Parliament approved the adoption of a so-called anti-coercion instrument, a powerful trade tool that would allow Brussels to impose tariffs, quotas, export controls or market freezes on countries, quote, seen to be engaging in economic bullying, end quote. A move which a Czech member of the European Parliament called a, quote, direct response to Chinese threats and coercion of Lithuania, a member state, when they dared to call their Taiwanese embassy Taiwanese, end quote. We will have more on Taiwan soon. But first, while we're here on Europe-China developments, we also note that the Ukraine has added the three biggest Chinese oil and gas producers, all state-owned companies, to its so-called international sponsors of war list, meaning that Kiev believes they help fund Russia's war effort. Ukraine uses the list as a way to pressure businesses into limiting their activity with Russia. Chinese companies on the list now number 12, more than any other nationality. China officially is neutral in the war. However, many Europeans, including European leadership, have criticized Beijing for being de facto supporters of the Russian side of the conflict. Now, finally for today's video, we move from one geopolitical flashpoint in Europe to one in Asia. This week, the annual US-Taiwan Defense Industry Conference, a closed-door event, is being held in the US state of Virginia. At the event, Taiwan's Vice Minister for Defense, Xu Yenpu, has called on Washington to speed up weapons deliveries as the military threat from the mainland grows. Quote, Given the ongoing Russian-Ukraine war, Taiwan and the U.S. have recognized the importance of speeding up the delivery of weapons systems to Taiwan to urgently beef up its defense capabilities. End quote. Over the last 18 months, Taiwanese officials have expressed concerns about delayed weapons deliveries, especially for Stinger missiles, which have proven to be very useful in Ukraine. Fortunately for Taipei, there is bipartisan support within the US for greater and swifter weapons deliveries to Taiwan. It is estimated that the current backlog of arms sales to Taiwan is valued at approximately 19 billion US dollars. To date, the White House has granted 345 million US dollars worth of aid under the so-called Presidential Drawdown Authority. At the event, Vice Minister Xu also asked that Washington help Taiwanese forces establish a so-called Total Life Cycle Systems Management, a system used by the US military to oversee all activities related to the development, acquisition, production, use, and eventual disposal of weapons across its life cycle. Quote, this would enable more Taiwanese defense companies and contractors to produce and offer maintenance services for U.S. brought weapons systems and help integrate the U.S.-Taiwan defense industry supply chain, enhancing Taiwan's defense autonomy and resilience. End quote. The three-day U.S.-Taiwan defense industry conference, organized by the U.S.-Taiwan Business Council, this year is discussing a wide set of topics, including, quote, emerging threats to Taiwan, 
supply chain challenges, Taiwan's defense policy, U.S.-Taiwan defense cooperation, cybersecurity, and the strategic paralysis of Taiwan's critical infrastructure in a potential cross-strait conflict. End quote. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Like I said, there may not be an episode tomorrow, but there will definitely be episodes back from Friday. Have a wonderful Wednesday, and I will see you all, hopefully, tomorrow.